Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening and good night. Welcome to this SEAM webinar series where we have a three figure global audience. This first talk is part of a series which is titled Trustworthiness, Reliability and Material Science for Aircraft Structures. Our first speaker will be the foundation speaker of this six part series. My name is Chris Burnt. I'm the director of SEAM and we are hosting this webinar series. I'd like to do a little bit of housekeeping before I introduce our speaker. Please make sure that you have mute on. Please make sure that you have video off. There is a chat function. Please use the chat function to ask any questions to our speaker, Mr. Neil Matthews. Let me repeat that. Mute should be off. Sorry, mute should be on. Video should be off and a chat, chat function can be used for questions. I'm now going to introduce very briefly our first speaker, Mr. Neil Matthews. Mr. Matthews is a fellow of the Institute of Engineers. He's the executive engineer. He's a nationally qualified engineer. He has been awarded the AM, which is a very prestigious title given, awarded by the Australian government for his work on aircraft structures and his service to the defence community. I'm now going to turn the chair over to Mr Neil Matthews. Mr Neil Matthews, the floor is yours. Well, thanks everybody for, for joining us. Um, I uh, appreciate the opportunity. I pre the, uh, appreciate the opportunity on behalf of what I consider a collaborative scientific engineering business uh, community. So my uh, my talk today is, I guess, uh, about the material science to implementation. And hopefully I can deliver some thoughts on the strategy for what I call is closing the gap. Um, and I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, I'll go through a number of elements. This is just a quick uh, outline so I'll do a bit of an overview I want to talk about this concept of the gap and uh, the concepts of filling the gap and hopefully at the end of the day uh, deliver some of the strategies which I think uh, will work and I think have been very very effective and then I'll just finish off <laughs> what we're seeing I guess and, and as I said in my abstract or my summary what we're seeing is the uh, evolution of new and innovative technologies um, and the element there is to be able to focus the research um, and the uh, technology so that they can deliver it and they'll be measured by delivering safe, reliable and commercial products to our customers and users. As part of uh, an industry uh, player, that is critical. I've often said in previous discussions from academia is this uh, uh, statement that you publish or perish. From a industry or commercial perspective, it's profit or perish. So there is some similarities, but um, what we've got to do is try and pull those together. Um, and what we've got to do is to basically shorten this gap between when we start to see good science to when we start to see good profits. I'm specifically uh, addressing during this, uh, this uh, webinar, surface engineered additive manufacturers, not because it's uh, the current uh, collaboration we have under SEAM, but it is where we have demonstrated success and achieved outcomes. So most of my presentation will be based on this concept of surface engineered and the additive process. I acknowledge full and well that there's a huge amount of effort and activity going into uh, additive manufacture of parts and the 3D creation of uh, shape. Um, a lot of what I'll say will apply to those, but my 
experience and the successes we have is in that other area. And they really relate to, uh, to two elements. And one is what we call sustainment. And that means to be able to uh, implement this innovation uh, to uh, enhance, to uh, repair, um, and uh, in some instance, some minor replacement. And the other area where we're actually seeing a significant um, benefit is in the, uh, the coating or the cladding. So we have technologies that now can replace what we call legacy uh, processes. I put up there the, uh, the Loyal Wingman, which is the uh, latest or the uh, recent aircraft that are being produced in Australia. What we've been able to do is uh, put on that uh, those components that we manufacture uh, additive uh, surface technology. I'm going to talk uh, and I'll drift in and out of these particular terminologies. We have two basically, if you like, surface engineered process. One is uh, what we call SPD, commonly known in other parts of the world as coal spray. The reason for that definition of coal spray is that it's not a considered to be a thermal process in as much as that we don't temper the powder or we don't temper the substrate. This is particularly uh, important in aircraft, particularly in aircraft structures, um, because we don't generate heat affected zones, we don't generate oxides, um, uh, and we, we do lots of other elements. Like any technology, there are limitations, particularly in terms of bond strength and those sorts of things. So the other uh, technology we've engaged in is uh, laser. Um, and uh, that's the laser additive uh, deposition. Obviously, people are familiar with that, but what we're doing is a powder based system that we're using. Um, it enables us to generate uh, 3D uh, characteristics. What we see there is, uh, in fact, at the bottom uh, left hand corner, what you will see there is, in fact, an aircraft part that has been recovered using. Uh, laser. The reason we had to uh, to go down that path, or we needed to go down that path, that's a high strength steel component uh, under a significant shear. So to get the bond strength, this was the only approach that was suitable, but it's shown to be effective. Um, I think it's worthwhile to start that we have uh, had a number of successes. Um, and I guess in part the recognition that I've received, which is really a reflection to me of the uh, of my team, but more importantly, the whole community. And what I talk about again, the whole community is it's the academia, it's the research, it's industries, it's my masters in Switzerland, we're a Swiss owned company. So their ability to fund research and those sorts of elements all contribute to these. And what you can see there, is I just run through them. We've been able to uh, deposit a whole range of powders um, uh, successfully. From an aircraft point of view, we've been able to uh, certify and release um, well over 50 repairs now. Um, and the durability of the technology is uh, each day is being continued to be demonstrated. We've I've got 9,000. We've probably got over 10,000 flight hours. Um, and we're not seeing any any degradation uh, in those uh, depositions or any adverse impacts on those. From a customer's point of view, what does it mean to him? It saves him money, um, but for the aerospace industry in particular, it provides uh, greater asset accessibility and availability. Um, and what uh, I think the whole community is moving towards this concept of the benefits of additive uh, technology. So the successes are there. And I think it's very important to start uh, this presentation off with those. Now, we're going to talk about the gap. So I'm going to refer to the technology readiness levels. Um, this is really, uh, it, it was, I, I think, developed by NASA in the 1970s, but this is a method of trying to demonstrate where the maturity of the technology is uh, along its path. Uh, and what you'll see, they've divided it up into uh, to nine. 
And what you effectively see is the, the role that traditionally is played. You have the academia looking after the technology research, the feasibility of the research, uh, and the technology demonstration, and those sorts of elements. Now, it's very, very important that as we go through, you'll see my approach is one of a flowback, and I'll explain that a little bit later. But what I don't want to do is never, never uh, stop or curve the innovation that's developed in the academia and that's initial science. So I don't want to do that. But what you can see there is this thing called the gap. People call it the valley of death. And what it really means is you get to a point where you believe through uh, experimentation, modeling, and all of those sorts of elements that you have something of value. The problem is then how do you get that from a uh, perceived value and a scientific value? How do you get that into the reality of a commercial world? And there's a fair amount of elements that uh, are sitting in what I call that technology development, right? And that is where many, many uh, innovations fail. It's often referred to the valley of death. Uh, it's a gap. Um, obviously, industry would like to be able to go out and buy solutions. And obviously, academia would like to basically say, well, I've done my job. I've, I've basically got to a point that I've proved the feasibility of the science. Unfortunately, uh, that's not the case. So it's important to understand that's a gap. We've been successful and I'll go through that, but I think there are better ways. So the way we have done this, uh, and I'll share this uh, uh, elements with you, the way that we have done this uh, traditionally is we have the academia, we have a level of uh, collaboration and we see, and SEAM is a classic example of where we're able to combine those various elements of academia, research, industry, and collaborate um, to achieve an outcome. This is particularly important, and this does fill the gap. The question uh, I'm going to raise today, is it filling the gap quick enough? Uh, and how can we uh, implement strategies to perhaps reduce that gap? Because that gap still exists. Hence my title, Filling the Gap 101. So I'll, uh, I'll talk to this briefly, and then I'll, I guess, present the challenges the, the innovative technology of additive manufacturing, and particularly in the surface engineering, what they actually present. I'm going to look down every so often because I have a watch and uh, I'm trying to keep on time. And I know that if I don't, uh, Chris will attack me uh, in a dark alley somewhere. Um, so I'm just trying to, uh, to monitor that. So if you've got any questions, happy to address those later. I'm just now going to um, briefly talk about the um, the opportunities and, and the challenge of AM acceptance. If I look at our current methodology, uh, normally to get acceptance, we focus on uh, design and application. We look at materials, we look at regulations, and we look at the, the processes. And what I'm talking about there be they uh, predominantly subtractive processes and things like that. What we see is that with the opportunity for additive manufacture, we are seeing things like new materials. For example, in, uh, in the SPD coal spray uh, world, there's a real potential to create new alloys on, in, in as much as that you can deposit them on a surface uh, in a almost an alloy uh, system at the uh, particle level. Um, and you can introduce new materials that would not normally be able to be done through the legacy or pre-existing thermal processes. So we're now looking at the ability to manipulate materials. We're looking at new processes. And each day you'll see somebody else uh, producing a new 3D printing machine, somebody else uh, doing that. If you look at the published papers on additive manufacture each day. There are numerous papers. So this technology is going at speed. I wouldn't call it light speed, but perhaps particle speed. That's probably a good an anomaly. Um, now we have regulations. The trouble is with regulations is they start to lag. 
um, and, and we're seeing that. So how do we address that? And in all the middle of this, all of that comes together because at the end of the day, it's got to be accepted by the customer and the customer will accept it if it's safe, it meets his requirements, it's reliable, uh, it's repeatable and it's cost effective. So here we see this, uh, the challenge that we, uh, we have with the additive manufacturing concept. I put this uh, together because it's, it's, I think it's uh, very, very pertinent. If you look at metals and net shape production and you uh, think about it, it's been around for thousands of years. Um, uh, and no, neither of those pictures of the Bronze Age or Iron Age. No, I did not model for any of those. Um, but the important thing is here is that that uh, ability or that length of period has enabled us to develop significant, what I consider, imperial data. And it enables us to uh, establish the metallurgical characteristic, properties, performance, and all those other elements that are, that are present there. So I think that's uh, quite significant. But what we see um, is that we are at the speed at which we are uh, in, uh, deploying uh, additive manufacturing is that we just don't have the time or the ability to produce that, what we call that empirical data. And I think that's quite significant. And that's where we chase, uh, really uh, face a real challenge from a science point of view, from a engineering point of view, from a commercial view. And this is just, uh, and, uh, and I'm sure people will be able to fill this out in a much more greater detail. But I'm saying here we are, if we look at additive uh, processes, right? I'm just talking about the two that we've got. We've got coal spray, we've got laser deposition. There's electric beam welding, there's HVOF. And I'm sure that people will say, ah, oh, but you haven't mentioned this one and you haven't mentioned that one. Yes, I have. They're in plus and plus plus and probably plus plus plus. And then we look at the elements associated with that process. Um, and we have things like equipment, the powder, the, you know, wire, gas, and again, plus, plus, plus. Then let's say, because we now have control over these, we can control a huge number of parameters. So laser powder, powder flow, um, uh, carrier gas, traverse speed. So we have the ability to manipulate deposition parameters. And what does that mean? On the positive side is we can develop lots of outcomes. There's no doubt about that. And the science and the experimentation enables us to do that. Um, but with that comes lots of potential variations. So how do we convince a customer that because we're in control of all of these uh, input variables and input parameters, that he's going to get a reliable and repeatable and safe outcome. And again, we get back into, this, into that element of the science shows us that we can do lots of things. The customer wants us to do lots of things, but at the end of the day, how do we uh, certify and, uh, and channel the application of this technology? Just to show you here some examples, when we talk about regulations, we, we see a whole stack, and this is in, particularly in, uh, in aircraft uh, design, we're seeing changes uh, as we speak, um, and this is coming out of uh, FAA and EASA and all sorts of people who are the regulatory bodies, they're starting to change their design concept where before they would effectively, in many instances, put a complete aircraft uh, un under test um, and then spend months, years doing full-scale fatigue testing and doing the validation of the design through a full-scale test. What we're now seeing is that that's very expensive, uh, extremely lengthy in its process. So now what we're seeing is a change to fail-safe designs, damage tolerance, so that we can um, build up um, to, a, to an outcome without doing that full-scale fatigue test. We're looking at um, standards for approved materials to try and control the variability. We're looking at 
uh, approved manufacturing process. We're looking at approved manufacturers and we're looking at quality conformance. So all of these sorts of things are trying to keep up with the evolution of this uh, innovation. <laughs> Design optimization is a classic and what we're able to do with the uh, modeling and the tools and the technology, we can see significant changes uh, and the ability to optimize design. But in optimizing design, we've got to be very, very careful that we don't get rid of redundancy, which are inherent in safety and those sorts of things. So we can push technology to the extreme, but we have to be very, very conscious of the regulations and understand that many of those regulations were put in place because of events. So to change those, we have to have a very, very significant body of evidence. And I'm going to just add this one in before we get into some real detail. The surface engineering, as opposed to the net shape, uh, gives us some challenges. And what I'm saying there is that what we are doing is that we're depositing on substrate material. Um, the top one is laser, the bottom one is coal spray or SPD. So what you see for a laser, for example, we've got three elements we've got to deal with now. We've got the deposition, which would normally be in net shape. We have a thing called an interface, but we're also impacting the substrate material. That is of uh, significance and concern because the design of that particular component with that particular metal didn't take into account the potential to change the substrate material. When you look at coal spray, we are basically uh, generating uh, the bond strength at the interface by impregnating the surface. And what we can see on a, the slide there, that has cha challenges. We can also, we now can potentially gem uh, generate durability issues from the interface. So we, we do have that extra challenge as we go along. So a lot of what we have to do, uh, which is perhaps again a little bit different to, to some of the things we see in Netshape, we have to convince the customer initially that whatever we do is not deleterious to his, uh, his original design, i.e. substrate material. So again, this is the focus of where we've got to go. Um, uh, I've, I've got this out of a, uh, a presentation. It's fairly accurate. It's the sort of thing. So the evidence we have to deliver um, is effectively all of these elements. Stability of the process, um, the repeatability uh, and the monitoring and the quality outcome and the recording of parameters for producibility. We need some level of predictability and I think that's becoming more and more important. You look at the elements of uh, a property characterization um, and that's fairly extensive. And now what we're seeing is uh, uh, the, the new element of durability and, and damage tolerance. <coughs> I guess the approach, one uh, on the left hand side comes from an extract from the military, US military, uh, damage tolerance and the other one on the right hand side is in fact an extract from uh, EASA and discussion we've had with the EASA. So the reasonable current concept is you build up, right? So you use specimens, you then go to the components. If you're looking at structure, you look at that and then you look at, at the actual specific applications. That's a good way. That's a good start. Um, but we need to look at that in more detail. So that's the fundamental building blocks that we look at when we look at generating evidence. To give you an example, if and, and this is what I've had to do for many of my application is basically go through each of these uh, elements and develop a te acceptance test programs and test plans to effectively not only get quantifiable outcomes, but in many of these cases, again, to demonstrate that we're not, uh, it's not deleterious to the existing design or the existing uh, uh, substructure. Um, and this is the approach. And while it's a good and we collaborate, 
I just wanted to show you some pictures there that, you know, that picture on the upper left is purely to develop optimization. So you can see again the number of those uh, uh, coupons that we're going to manufacture and test and analyze and microstructure and, uh, and things like that. Um, and if you look on the right hand side, upper right hand, they're just uh, specimens we prepared for tensile testing. So if you can see if you can think about this sort of a test program in relating to all of those test elements, right? Even simple things like optimization of uh, path modeling and those sorts of things require significant amount of uh, uh, investment. Fortunately, this is where the science and this is where the academia are able to play a significant part so they can assist us in developing these these tools. But if I said to them what you would need to do is that's the full test block of parameters proceed down that path, it would mean that the gap whilst we'll cover that gap will still main, retain or a lengthy uh, gap. This is the end of outcome. This is an actual uh, uh, full scale fatigue test that we're able to engage uh, as part of this to develop and validate the uh, test coupons or SPD depositions. It's not something that we want to do very long um, very expensive. So again, we've got to focus on how we can get that evidence without necessarily going to this. Uh, just to give you a, a very quick element, this is uh, the, the journey we've had. Um, so if you consider that uh, we're engaged by the customer to look at the technology, we've had some success, but we're still in, what, 12, 13 years later, still trying to get to that desirable element of having it fully uh, certified and accepted for structural credit and structural applications. So it's so still a long time. So what I'm saying here is that this is filling the gap 201. So what I'm really driving at here is we've got to listen to the customer. What does he need? What is his requirements? Um, and then what we do is that that will drive or should drive the application development and the acceptance criteria. And we've effectively got to drive that into science. So when we talk about the collaboration, what we're effectively saying is that to get the best outcome and to reduce the gap, we really need to be driving this from a commercialization basis, call it industry, call it whatever. Um, and the key here is how do we get the science to the customer? So let the customer tell us what he's really after. We can assist, but that's the methodology. And I show that, and the first thing is the application. If you were to do the full suite of those tests, you'd be there for a long, long time. He doesn't necessarily need it. So maybe what we've got to do is do classifications. What sort of the applications? Is it structural? Um, is it non Is it non-structure, but can carry load. So this is an example of what we use at the moment for our customer to basically define the characteristics and the element of risk. So we basically say, okay, if you're going to use it, we don't think that's a significant repair and we'll provide you with the evidence to support that. The more you go into this uh, structural critical and things like that, the more the customer is going to be demanding, rightly so, because the consequence of failure uh, are, are, are very uh, high. So I'm just going to go through and see how we go about trying to, to package this original one up and tailor it to, to where we want to go. So this is the filling the gap phase two. So I think it's very, very important that you must start, if you're going to go down this path, with a process that is stable and reliable. I've been very, very guilty of trying to do both at the same time where we're trying to establish the stability of the process and we're trying to generate uh, test specimens. It all sounds good, this parallel activity, but I can tell you now that in many instances, you can end up going down the wrong path. So I think it's very, very important to stabilize it, identify your input parameters, um, have good powder suppliers, have reliable equipment, um, 
implement a uh, qualification uh, process, integrate your build quality parameters and make sure that you have in process monitoring. Um, we meant to mention about uh, it within one of those columns is the predictability. Now I'm going to in introduce the concept of modelling. Uh, I think this is uh, quite significant and we need to focus more and more as a community on modelling. Uh, we have the tools, we have the computational power, uh, uh, power, we have historical information that we can utilise um, and I think this is so important. For example, if I look at SPD, <coughs> when you actually look at it, it's a science based technology. So it is, uh, it's based on kinetic energy. And I think if we all remember our physics, if that still exists in a high school, uh, it may exist under another name, but you can calculate critical velocities. You can calculate the amount of deposition. You can look at uh, those sorts of some elements. You can conduct FEA studies. So what we should be doing where possible um, is to, con uh, to look at the concept of modelling and analysis as an initial part of this process. To give you some examples, we've already done this. So this is an example out of a, uh, uh, a wing skin. So what we did is that, or not we, um, Monash is uh, highly involved in this. What we did is we set about modelling and looking at how a, a system would perf uh, behave um, in its pure state, how it would behave with a crack and how it would behave uh, with the SPD repair. So we, out of that application and that analysis, we believe that we could restore the, for example, the buckling load. Then we went on and did the test. So the validation of the test, the test was there to validate the model. And this was again, uh, we got good correlation. Okay, I'm going to whip through these. Similarly, um, I'm talking about uh, model and the ability to uh, characterise um, the uh, the application. And I think again, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that we do analysis, we do testing, and this is about simply about embedding or uh, uh, restoring damage to a, a, a surface. So what we've effectively said is, OK, uh, we know how the material will perform through analysis. If it had no repair, how does it perform with uh, with varying degrees or at varying depths? How do we uh, how does it perform if we fill that depth? And this is again an approach we've taken, which clearly shows the benefit of doing that analysis, which we can validate then by test. Um, fatigue, crack growth, predictability again, there is enough information around um, and certainly enough uh, analy analytical information and modelling that we can predict the behaviour of, uh, of, of this process. So we need to do that. We need to, and then we can develop, if we're not sure, we can develop the relevant tests. Um, again, simple is that this is what we've done to use, utilising the, the SPD under a whole range of uh, uh, flight load, realistic, uh, what we call uh, max loading. Um, and we can, out of that, develop the predicted flight hours and the um, increase in um, uh, the cycle count and, and, and those sorts of things. So we can do that predicting. And then when we want to, we can go back and validate through, through that. Again, this is one that's just been done recently for, for laser. We can model and we can look at what potential damage we can do to the substrates and, and those sorts of elements uh, so that we can perhaps set our uh, parameter or optimization parameters in a much tighter group because we've got an understanding of how uh, the, uh, the temperature may affect the substrate. So, <laughs> Um, here's some uh, concepts, right? They're my concepts um, based on, I guess, uh, history, but also based on where I think we uh, need to be. You've got to understand the customer's re re requirements with respect to what does he want done? What's he expect? We know he wants it to be safe. Somebody will say he wants it done for half the price you think it should be, and then he'll want to reduce the price further. 
and he'll want it done yesterday. We know all that, but you've got to understand that. You've also got to understand, particularly in aircraft, there is a huge uh, regulatory um, authority framework, and we've got to meet those. Try and uh, and and agree and acceptance test requirements, right? Um, so those can be all flown uh, flowed down into this initial work of science. So we can then, and what we're trying to do with SEAM and other collaborations is saying, this is what the customer wants. We think this is the body of evidence that is necessary uh, to meet those requirements and then focus the science on those elements to produce the evidence that we need to uh, get acceptance. Um, make sure that your processes and procedures that you're going to embark on are relatively stable and repeatable. Um, so if you're going to use laser and a laser process, make sure that you're confident that the equipment you use, the process and the procedures is going to give you the same outcome because the variation in that destroys the whole basis of, of your test outcomes. Endeavour to develop predictable modelling analysis, uh, analysis and then validate it by test, not the other way around. Uh, you can spend a lot of time doing uh, testing and then people tend to try and make the curve fit, right? So I'm just saying generate the curve and then see where the application sits. Um, you've got to provide that body of evidence to the customer regulatory requirements, otherwise it's, uh, it's a dead duck. <coughs> and implement a building block approach, right? So, and as I say, the introduction there is I'm saying modeling, then your coupon testing, then your component validation, and then if you're in structures, we get into another whole range of things. So from my point, how good is additive manufacturing? It's a statement, it may not mean much to many people, but it certainly means much to me. Is it the best thing since bottled beer? Not quite, not quite, because, um, as we develop the uh, the manufactured solutions, we need to acknowledge the challenges uh, of the product acceptance, the acceptance rules, uh, and all of those sorts of things. <coughs> and and we can use the the history of conventional metal manufactured solutions as a must. You must understand the technology limitations and manage customers' expectations. It will not solve all the problems. It's a good thing but it's not the, the be all and end all. I just wanted to briefly say that as part of our SEAM activities, we are looking at uh, opportunities. We are looking at opportunities on other collaborative programs. Um, and what we're looking in this particular program is again defining the applications and the focus of the initial body of, of evidence to ultra high speed laser additive repairs. We from a customer perspective, think there's value in it, but we also understand there are challenges. So what we're trying to do is focus the science into that area. Um, we've already had some uh, initial uh, initial outcomes, and this is one of those things of uh, uh, we've been able to publish rather than perish, uh, and we see that level of uh, activity going on. And if you look, and I can deliver many, many other uh, journal papers and things like that where we're down that pathway. So with, and it does work, and I just, this is my last slide. Um, what I'm saying here, it does work. And all of these people here that I'm seeing, I'm gonna acknowledge them all. I could have put them in a big list, but that's where the science come from. That's our customer. We're playing a role at the moment in the application development and certification. So thank you for your attendance. For those that are still awake, I appreciate your uh, stamina. For those that are asleep, I hope that's given you some energy for the rest of the day, evening, or whatever. So thank you. Th thank you, Neil. So the floor is now mine, just for a little while, and there are some questions popping up. I'm going to take these out of sequence. So, so Neil, the first question comes from uh, Steve up in Roma. Um, Cold spray is near net and not net. Can you speak more to the machinability of cold spray materials? In his experience, it has been difficult. He says very, uh, very different to machine a billet 
versus a cold spray metal. So can you address the aspect of machinability of cold spray materials uh, with regard to the current bill of materials, which are often you know, not cold sprayed? Is that making sense, I, Neil, the question? Yes, yes, it is. Um, I guess from our point of view, um, we've not seen that. Um, we basically, in, on all our applications that we've put on aircraft, um, we treat it as exactly the same as the substrate material. So in terms of machinability, in terms of uh, 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 NDT, in, in terms of um, post-processing, like post-machining uh, activity, like we uh, machine it, we meet the original uh, requirements. Um, and I think a lot of this has to do with how dense your coating is uh, and those sorts of elements. So if you can get very, very dense um, depositions, they should, and our experience is they basically behave, behave the same as a bulk material. So we don't, we don't treat it any differently once it's deposited. So we let, treat it exactly let, the same. Let me drill down a little bit more and please forgive the pun. Yep. What, are there any special differences or needs with regards to cold spray machining vis-a-vis -vis conventional machining? Do you have to change anything in your machining protocols or is this something that you've just learnt how to do? No, we, as I say, when we consolidate, our consol SPD consolidation gives us a, a material, very similar to bulk material, and we apply exactly the same machining process. So we do not differentiate between a conventional uh, material and a SPD deposition. Thank you. The next question comes from Andrew at Swinburne. This concerns damage tolerant design for aircraft. Yes. So with regards to damage tolerant design for aircraft, what is the, the approach that you experience with your customers and what are the assumptions concerning the design for damage tolerance? Let, let me try to add a little bit of what I think is clarity. You know, defect tolerance, um, how, how do you look at the defects within, say, a cold spray coating? Do you need to change your processes or your NDE for uh, on using the the cold spray terminology, not SPD, yeah. the cold yep. spray activity. Can you add just a little bit or embellish the damage tolerance approach? Okay, so the damage tolerance approaches, which is particularly being adopted by the US Air Force, and there is a, a mill standard around this, is particularly what, they, um, what they're looking at is um, uh, what they call an initial floor size and they give it another term called EADS, but effectively what they say is that you assume in any manufactured product that there is a pre-existing floor. So what they're looking at is basically saying a floor size and I, I've got it somewhere, but I'm going to say, oh, I don't know, about a quarter of an inch or something like that, right? And that floor is, it can be a crack, uh, I mean, a, a, a uh, poor or that sort of surface defect. And from then, they basically apply um, under a, a, a fatigue spectrum, a block loading, you can then look at crack growth. So what we are doing at the moment, we're doing two elements. The first one is to determine what is the typical floor size within this uh, uh, process, right? And that's why I say it's very, very important to have repeatability because within that repeatability, we can now uh, look at the, um, under microstructure, under those test samples, we can basically say, we have very, very dense coating, uh, coatings, the typical floor size in the deposition, um, uh, which is a measure of porosity, we can do that. We can also look at the um, interface to look at, um, let's say, uh, surface uh, penetration and those sorts of things. So we can come up with that a initial uh, size. What we're also doing now is that we're looking at crack growth 
from that nominated acceptable floor size to give us. And what we've found is that the positive material behaves exactly the same as the bulk material. But we're also focusing on um, that initial. How long does it take to get to that initial floor size um, or that that defined floor size from a floor, uh, from a pour or something like that? Uh, OK, um, Bill, so, so let me just allow you to focus just a little bit more with regards to damage tolerance. Rather than treating the coating as having flaws, can you address the situation where cold spray is used to repair flaws? So rather yes, than cold spray producing flaws, can you address the repair of flaws? And as you do this, can you drop a few names? You've mentioned some organisations, but for those people who are taking notes or want to listen to the recording later, can you drop any names that come to your mind who are experts in this area? Certainly from the, uh, the durability issue, which is fundamentally looking at crack initiation uh, and crack growth, um, we can basically, the likes of, of Monash, RMIT are doing something, Swinburne's doing something as part of this collaborative program. So we're all developing um, the, uh, some of the empirical data, Certainly Monash um, or Professor Rhys Jones is a subject matter expert in uh, in the analytical elements of those. So that's uh, ongoing. Um, as terms in, in terms of repairs, what we assume when we do a repair, if we know there's a flaw there, we will remove it. Right. So the, the question there is in removing the repair or removing the damage, um, that hopefully eliminates crack initiation or, or substantial uh, pre-existing flaws. Then what we also do though is the the element that we uh, we have to uh, address then is um, do we basically sell the repair as a non-structural repair in as yep. much that we, we don't give the deposition any credit or do we give the deposition credit? And that's the phase that we're in now because uh, and that's the most challenging because what we're dealing with is we're dealing with a customer and audience who's risk adverse. Um, okay. The technology is new, so we've got to manage that. Thank you, Neil. So I have another question, slightly different, uh, slightly different area from Ashok. Let me rephrase the question. You've talked about the valley of death or the gap 101. Gap 101 yep. is a lovely term, by the way. I'm going to use that yep. and credit you with it. Um, Thank you. So we've talked about academia not knowing or being able to interact with industry. However, how about the other way around? From your experience, not necessarily talking about RUAG specifically, but in industry in general, what is your opinion about the openness of industry willing to listen to academia for input? Um, let, let, I me find rephrase, that, let me rephrase yep. that. We've got publish and perish versus yep. publish and profit. Yep. Yeah. So look, I, I think, and that, and that's almost in the individual elements. If you've got an innovative company that's looking at the future, so it's all about, I guess, and 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 risk mitigation. So if you've got a company that's astute enough to see that emerging technologies can enhance their profitability, um, then you'll get the support because there's still a level of investment to fill that gap. Um, there's investment in time, investment in people, but you convert that there's an investment in dollars. So what you then have is you have the issue about whether the customer is looking for short term quick solutions and, and profitable solutions. I'm always a bit wary of that, but if you've got a customer or a, a, an industry that is genuinely interested in uh, bringing on board innovation, then I think you can then make that link. Um, the element of the methodology of doing that is to look at, and there is a, an enormous amount of focus um, at political levels in, in business and, and things like that to get this collaboration going. So. I think there's a genuine interest out there, but it certainly will depend on 
the uh, commercialization aspect uh, and what the customer wants. If he wants a solution tomorrow um, and he wants it fully certified and all those sort of things, that's where I'm saying manage the expectations, right? If yep. you manage the expectations and find out what he really wants, if he wants a quick buck and he wants to you know, jump on the back of innovation, um, then that's, a, to me, that's a high risk uh, okay. adventure. Thank you, Neil, for making us aware of the risk argument, something which is very important uh, because it is because we as academics often define risk as different from that of industry. Yep. I've got one final question and I'm going to yep. wind together two other questions. And essentially it's about measuring the properties of these coatings, uh, for example, non-destructive testing, for example, is ASTM C633, the so-called tensile adhesion test, the be end and end all of measuring a material property for cold spray? You showed some lovely figures of tensile test coupons, uh, or, which I presume were just of the coating. You showed yep. cross sections of coatings. You yep. have not talked about uh, in vitro sorry, uh, live diagnostic testing to measure speeds and uh, velocities. So within the testing regime, what would you, what are some closing comments that you can make about the actual physical testing of coatings for the qualification of these coatings? Is my question making sense? Absolutely, and it's something that we, we're very fixed on. If you looked at that, uh, part of my presentation that looked Can at. Can you go back to that but, slide where you yes. show coupons? Yeah, but I want to go back. I'm just going to go back to where I really want. I think this question is sort of going to. Um, okay. So there's two slides I'm going to show. Sorry, uh, very sensitive. So what we're talking about is those first three elements, right? And yep. we're uh, this is this is part of the process going forward because the question is quite valid at the moment we do a lot of our quality acceptance through destructive testing of coupons um, what we do in our quality uh, system is up till now what we've been doing is saying when we put down a uh, a deposition for sale or for implementation we also do a sacrificial uh, specimen not unlike when you uh, look at some of the activity when you look at electroplating and some of the other things so we're using the the coupon to look at things like porosity um, interface characteristics um, and those sorts of elements right so that's one element so there's two parts of that question is are the, t the tests that we define is be uh, the b spec the the ideal um, uh, spe uh, testing for adhesion no it's not no it's not and we've done other elements but the fact is that's what the customer wants so again, we can, we can be in a position where we say there are much better tests. And if there are, and you can convince the customer, then that's not a problem because you'll have the evidence and the, and the logic. Uh, from the quality point of view, um, we don't believe that the destructive testing on coupons is an effective way to measure what we consider is items that currently can't uh, be measured. For example, the bond strength and those sorts of things. We can look at current NDTs to look at uh, subsurface floors and those sorts of things. But the key here is to basically, once you have the process and the procedure to do in monitoring, and what we're saying here is, where is it? That's what I'm talking about. So what we've got to do is the in process and monitoring and control. control. So we so can do things. Middle box, monitor and yep. feedback. Yep. Monitor and feedback. You've got all of those ticks. Those yep. ticks cost a lot of money. They do. They do. <laughs> yep. So the value have, proposition? The value proposition there is that if you can implement those, and they do cost money, all that means is that you can be very, very comfortable that what you're giving the customer as an, appli uh, as an application is going to meet quality performances and in fact some of the regulatory bodies now are saying you must have in process monitoring and control because the concept of having destructive uh, specimens 
doesn't cover the risk because of so many variables in the process. And they're saying that, yes, you coat that specimen, but there are so many variables that when you coat your destructive specimen, how can you be assured that some of the uh, critical parameters haven't changed? OK, so, so we're, going to we're going to close down now, but uh, before, yeah. we, before I make my final comments, which I've published as well, but I will also narrate them, I'm going to ask Neil to make any final comments about um, the industry, about the way forward. Just a short summary, Neil, for, for you to have an opportunity to uh, fly a flag or promote something which you think is important. Sorry to put you on the spot, but this is your opportunity. No, no, for... no I think there are two, as two, two, oh, well, three significant elements. First of all, science, uh, creativeness, innovation, all of those elements are, are vitally important, I believe, uh, going forward in, in the field of additive manufacturing. Um, the customer is extremely important because at the end of the day, that's where you're going to be measured uh, at the end of the day. So the customer is particularly important. So look at that strategy of how do I meet the customer's requirements? How do I link the science with those requirements, preferably through collaboration because the cost of any one individual or any one element or organisation undertaking those three elements is prohibitive, much too long, and in most cases, the gap won't be necessarily filled. So whether we like it or not, we must listen to the customer to get the uh, the rewards out of innovation. OK, so one, I've also published two further questions, but we don't have time to go through those. Um, as they say with me, it's the quick order dead. <laughs> so yep. you do need to be quick with the uh, questions. So let me go through my closing comments, which I've also published. This talk has been recorded and will become available on the same website in due course. Usually we do that within a few days. So explore the SEAM website and you can usually find it very quickly by Googling ARC SEAM. The second point, it is important for me to acknowledge that SEAM is a collaborative among the Australian Research Council, the ARC, many industries and three prime universities. These universities being Swinburne Uni SA in South Australia and RMIT in Melbourne. We thank these three bodies for their support. Number three, the next talk is planned for the time frame of about March the 18th by Professor uh, Tony Clinock, FRS, FRNG from Imperial College in London. And the title of his talk is Sticking Up for Glue. The, my final point uh, will be a huge thank you to Neil Matthews AM for an absolutely wonderful foundation presentation that sets the scene for the series Trustworthiness, Reliability and Material Science for Aircraft Structures. The fifth point, which I've not published, is a big thank you for the people who are working behind the scene, the behind the scenes uh, in these scene presentations. Thank you to Phil from IT and thank you to Andrew and Vesta from SEAM. I'm now going to formally close down this uh, series. Thank you to everyone, and we look forward to meeting again on March the 18th, if not before. Thank you and goodbye.